I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Dan Danahar, is uh, uh, an expert in uh, biodiversity education. So, and, and Dan has been very much involved in uh, creating butterfly havens, and I think one of the first ones you did was at Dorothy Stringer School, is that mm -hmm. correct? And um, Dan's topic of, of his talk is about creating butterfly havens. But one of the other things I understand that you were very much involved in is getting people to count butterflies and identify butterflies. And that led to uh, the big butterfly count, which is something that butterfly conservation do every year. And I, I try and do that myself, to sit in my garden for 15 minutes and see what butterflies flap, flap, flap past so that you can then send your records in. And I, I know that you, you were involved in, in setting that up and championing that uh, as one of the things that, you, that you've done in your, in your career. Um, so you're, you're very much at the heart of conservation for butterflies and chalk grasslands. And we're looking forward very much to hearing what you've got to tell us. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Dan. Thank you, Sally. It's nice to see you all here. Um, uh, you know, when the other Sally, Sally Milne, Milne isn't it? Yes. When she said to me, would you give a talk? I mean, it, it was, there was no question about it from my point of view. I'm really proud to have your logo up on a talk that I'm giving today. I think the work that your group does is fantastic. And, you know, if it wasn't for groups like your own doing this necessary conservation work, uh, then we would have been a real big mess. But, you know, actually, we're very lucky. Brighton and Hove is a fantastic place where there's lots going on. You know, just over the hill somewhere else, there'll be another group doing something. And there's loads and loads of groups within our city, within the biosphere. And, uh, you know, so that's something to be really, really proud about. Um, you may not have heard of Big Nature. Big Nature is a charitable company that I'm an um, uh, executive chair for. And, and our work was set up shortly after the International Year of Biodiversity in 2010 to promote habitat restoration, the creation of habitats within the biosphere uh, region. And um, the idea behind that was um, that we would try to get people to not just engage, but really enjoy that whole experience. Uh, and so I've put here how to create a butterfly haven uh, with a little help from your friends. You know, uh, and one thing that's really clear to me as I go through and do all the various bits of work that I do, none of it is then a bit about any one person. <coughs> it's all ways joined up. So what I've done is in this talk, and I've never given this talk before in its current form. So bear with me, I've never practiced this before. It may not be exactly what I expect it to be. Um, but I've tried to incorporate bits of information about, I think, key figures who have helped me personally move my goals on and also help uh, the rest of our city uh, move its goals on with regards to biodiversity as a whole. So, OK, let's just start at the very beginning. There you go, that was it. 19, for me, it was 1994. I was doing a PhD at the University of Sussex. And I came across this paper, The Recreation of Early Successional Stages for Threatened Butterflies, an Ecological Engineering Approach. So basically, a group of scientists got together and they came up with this idea. What they had done was they had looked at anthills. Here's a profile of an anthill. Uh, this is north, south, and then there was east and west. And they measured the temperature at different points along that profile. And they found that the profile itself actually affected the temperature at the ground level. I've, I've looked at this many times and I find it quite hard to understand because I can see if the sun's coming down on that side there, I'd expect that to be equally quite hot. But it actually peaks right at the very top there, you can see that. And then I'd expect this side to be very, very cold. I'd expect it to drop really quickly. But nevertheless, this is what they found. And they said, well, maybe if that's what happens. Maybe if we can really manipulate the temperature at ground level, maybe we can make up a whole range of conditions that would be good for butterflies. And so they suggested that here, you take off the topsoil, you dig, dig that off, then you dig a little gutter, and the chalk you take out, you put on the top there, and suddenly you've got this bank. Now look at this, this is two metres here. That's quite a big area. Here we're talking about eight metres, you know, for, well, two yards for those of us who don't do metres. 
so these were quite big structures. Um, and that was it. I mean, I never really... I mean, I thought about it, but I was a student at the University of Sussex. I knew there's no way they were going to let me dig up the campus. <laughs> so we're then talking... This is 2006 now, so we're now talking, uh, what, uh, 12 years later. And I was working as a school teacher at Dorothy Stringer School, and I was in a really, really uh, lucky position. I mm. got into a position where I was paid for five days' work. I taught for three days a week, and for two days a week they said, do whatever you want as long as it's environmentally related. And at the same time the Blair government was in, in uh, power, they pushed this agenda called the Sustainable Schools Strategy, which meant we were responsible for um, informing our local communities about sustainability, biodiversity, all of these issues, climate change. So that just meant I could suddenly start working with the city, not just be a teacher, and working with the city in ways that I could never have dreamed possible. It was just a delightful thing, and I really feel like, you know, that was a very positive part of my... 15 years I did it, 15 years. 22 years at the school in, in total. Um, and then this came up. You know, prior to this particular grant, it was really like the uh, ethos that local education authorities would always supply all funding for everything that every single school did. And it was ridiculous, because here we have a school, uh, lots of schools that, you know, wanted to do things, but couldn't apply for things like this. But they said, no, no, this. So this is BBC worked with the National Lottery, and they said you could apply for up to £10,000, and you could do some conservation projects to get children involved. And I thought, well, that's fantastic. I knew there'd be lots of schools that would be applying for money to plant trees for woodlands, and I knew that there would be lots and lots of schools applying for ponds. I didn't think many of them would apply for money to topographically modify chalk grassland, to manipulate microclimate at ground level for early succession of chalk grassland butterflies. <laughs> I was right. <laughs> they gave us the £10,000. And this is Dorothy Stringer School. So this is a 28-hectare campus, which is amazing. You know, it's a great opportunity to play. We were the r lucky... Uh, school with a fragment of woodland. It was once a farm, so this was the remainder of the woodland. And we'd already had some experience of funding for things like educational ponds we have here, we had an environment centre here. But this was a bit of land that I was particularly interested in because it wasn't flat and it couldn't be used for amenity purposes, uh, sport or things like that. So I suggested that we put a whole, whole range of banks in, in, the, in, in this bit here. So let's just go back. There's the woodland. There's a woodland. You get some idea now. So that was a proposal. We made the proposal, we made the application, and we got the money. So the first thing you do when you're doing something like that is you think, well, what have I already got there? So we did, the, with the children, we did a little survey, and we found that we had about 10 wildflower species in the municipal amenity grassland that was already there. You know, you've got the council going out year after year, mowing it, fertilising <coughs> it, treating it in the standard way that they had been doing up to that point. And that this was... The outcome. There it is. I mean, actually, I actually think that looks quite nice. <laughs> we really pulled it apart. Um, so this is before the work uh, happened. This is the day when the bulldozers arrived. And it was a very peculiar thing because it was the, the holidays. Uh, and uh, Summer holidays. And everybody had gone off. And the bulldozer guy says, so where would you like me to dig, Gov? And I thought, is that really my responsibility? I said, well, let's start here. We'll do a trench. And anyway, <coughs> we started working, and here we are. This, so this is the first removal of the topsoil. And then with the subsoil, we mixed that and the chalk bedrock. And, and that's what we did all the way along. And look, here we go. Look, so here's the topsoil removed from the west facing, and we put it down there. Uh, and we got this construction of the first south facing slope there. You can just see the first slope being constructed. So it's quite a large area. It's about half the size of a football pitch. Well, I should say, why are we doing that? Because topsoil has, is filled with nutrients. And wildflowers don't cope very well with nutrients. Grasses, on the other hand, do. So you leave the nutrients there and you put your wildflower seed mix or your wildflower plugs in, and the grasses will grow mad and the, and the, and the wildflowers won't. So you remove it and you leave basically the bare chalk. So here we get all this bare chalk. And like, this is the final configuration. So we had a great big bank there, a medium-sized bank there, and a tiny one there. And they the same here on this west-facing slope. Now, we did that because we didn't really know what was going to be the right size for these banks. We were just messing about, trying to experiment with it. But one thing I would like to point out is that they're all linear. They're all straight lines except for here and here. So, first one of my friends. This is John Gapper. So, John, I don't even know what his parks department title of his job was, 
But John recognised that there was a need to conserve local wildflowers. He developed methods of mass cultivation for the wildflowers and now inspired the creation of the Wildflower Conservation Society Brighton and Beyond. So obviously this guy in his lifetime has made a very real contribution. Helped me out no end in many ways. So I was, it was very serendipitous. I met uh, John. He was growing all these wildflowers every single year, not like the Millennium Seed Bank where you put the seed in the bank and you got it forever. He had to grow it every year in order to maintain his stock. So he, here's a plant. He'd remove all the soil, just, a, just this bit here, then give that to us, and we'd put that in the ground, just make a hole in the chalk, put that in the ground, and then close it up, and that would mean that the plant really had to push its roots out quickly, very quickly, in order to survive. And you're not introducing sort of foreign material into it. Uh, and there's all of these wildflowers. Look, this is now, this is at Stammer these days, and this is the great big wildflower nursery, and it's so exciting to see that this is happening. For a long time, we were worried it wouldn't happen. John was getting older and older, and we are thinking, oh, that knowledge would be lost. But no, it's really happening. So going back to 2007 and 2008, 1,700 school children participated in planting that wildflower, uh, pl those wildflower plugs. Now, for me personally, this is like a very important part of the process. The ch you guys know, we watch children daily be bombarded by environmental catastrophe on the news and in the, in the, on the TV, in the uh, newspapers, Instagram. It doesn't matter. There aren't many good news stories. But what we were doing here was saying, you can do something. You can change it. And as you will see, I hope, as talk progresses, they learned that there was something very positive about that. So 1,700 school children were engaged by planting up the wildflower plugs. Here we are, April 2008. Some sorrel, some strawberry, toe flax, and this is a very beautiful plant, the uh, host of the Chalk Hill Blue and the Adonis Blue, which is uh, the horseshoe vetch. And look, here's John's table. He actually gave 5,515 wildflower plugs that we put in, which was great. We paid him, I think. Can't remember, it's such a long time ago. <laughs> anyway... So the, the next thing we did was we bought a propriety seed mix. Now, I would not do that now. You don't know where the seeds come from when you buy from one of these big companies. It could have come from Holland or somewhere like that. In fact, actually, when you think about it, Holland is exactly where Dutch, uh, sorry, not, uh, where Chilara, the, the ash dieback came from, when we imported ash trees, and we got loads of ash trees. So why we did that, I don't know. So it's great that you're working with someone like John, who's working with local provenance genetic sourcing. But anyway, we took this wildflower seed mix. It was an EM6 wildflower seed mix from Emma's Gate Wildflower Company. And here we are. We did this, uh, I think, a couple of hours. We did it in sections, and this was the next day. <laughs> now, it was great because it gave it a cold treatment, uh, uh, and so therefore stratification took place. As it melted, it uh, released water, so that helped with the germination process. And it held it in place. We had worked with seed before. And sometimes you can be unlucky and it can just blow away or it can slip down and you have it all at the bottom and not up the side. But this was fantastic. Apparently you can order this online now. Um, so anyway, here we are, EM6 uh, C-Mix. Look, this is all the different species that were in here. Some grasses as well. See, this is one of the reasons why I would say don't do it. Look, um, this is a percentage of the mix. You can see these are very low numbers, but look at this. This one particular grass here, 30%, 25%. Why are we putting grasses in when we're trying to grow wildflowers? Doesn't make any sense to me. So that's why I, in part, don't do this anymore. One thing I'd like to point out, though, is, look, kidney vetch, 1.5% of the mix. That's all it was, not very much. Okay, look, this is one year after the initial planting. Now, look, I've got to say, if you look at that and think, hmm, doesn't look so good, Dan. I think I might be tempted to agree with you. But let's look a bit closer, shall we? Okay, look, you can see here, we did not plant there. We did plant there. We did not plant there. We did plant there. We did not plant there. And this is what came up. Nearly, I'd say, 70% of that was kidney vetch. And it was great because kidney vetch is a host plant for the small blue, which is the emblem of your group. And this is what we were one of our target species. It's got, it's got its own biodiversity action plan. It's got nationally notable species. So it would have been a really, really good butterfly to uh, attract. Okay, this is what I say. Which salad would you prefer on your plate? This is before, this is after. I mean, look at the diversity there. It's just great, isn't it? It's really fantastic. Um, 
but don't take my word for it. So this is the objective view. Now, this is the late Liz Williams, who was a lovely woman. She was a botanist and she died very shortly after this. So we then named the Butterfly Haven after her because like you, know, you people know, you're volunteers yourselves. We give our time freely because we're passionate and we believe that what we're doing is the right thing. And she was exactly the same. She, her heart was really in the right place and she did some great work for us. And this is Peter Hodge, an entomologist. And this is, this is like after one year. Do you remember there were 10 plants? Was it 10 or 12? I don't know. So 97 wildflowers there. 97 species. That's an order of magnitude increase in a year. Now, of course, we put wildflower seeds in, we put wildflower plugs in, we disturb the ground, therefore the seed bank had been disturbed and they would come up. And then, of course, you've got all those opportunistic species that come in on their own accord, like dandelions and things like that. So we massively had increased the, uh, the biodiversity of the flora on that site. And I think this is an important thing to underscore here. This is not just about biodiversity education. This is about increasing biodiversity. Now, I feel like as we've gone on, and as you will see, we've really refined the work that we do and the management that we undertake on this site and others. Um, but I would never claim that what we're producing is ancient chalk grassland like you're trying to protect when you're doing it. That's not the case. We don't, we, it's not that established ancient chalk grassland. This is what I would call surrogate habitat, just like a surrogate mother. We're, pro we're providing something that enables some components of our natural heritage to survive. You know, I work a great deal in Corfu. I can go out for one day, me too will tell you, I can go out one day and see many hundreds of butterflies. And here I can go out one day and maybe be lucky if I see one. We've lost so much. You've all seen it in your lifetimes through the industrialization of our landscape, the loss of hab habitat fragmentation, loss of habitat, uh, neonicotinamides having a big impact on insects and therefore farm birds. So this is an amazing outcome. Peter did his invertebrate survey, not nationally scarce species here. Uh, here, nationally scarce. Uh, recent colonist. Uh, uh, look, read data book three. Rare and uh, got its own biodiversity action plan. So these are the types of things. Now, look, you know, I've used throughout my career butterflies as big flagship species. And most people, not everybody, but most people like butterflies. So it's easy to try and use those as a hook to get people into thinking about biodiversity. But these are the little cogs in the machine. These are the things that make ecosystems work. Without a complex, healthy ecosystem, there's loads of services that you and I depend on. If you want to learn about that, just type into Google ecosystem services. You'll be surprised and somewhat worried, I would have thought, about what we will lose if we lose too much biodiversity. So many of these, this was a recent colonist from, uh, um, from Europe. We were the first site in the UK to get that. Um, this here, the red, uh, red data book species that broke the toad flakes brocade and so forth. So obviously some of the really nitty gritty stuff that most people wouldn't be excited about we were getting as well and that's part of the educational process. And of course there's butterflies. So immediately first of all we got the common blue and we got the, um, the meadow brown. They're the two commonest species in the UK and I would say that they came before we did anything. That used to be mowed for years. That, you remember I said this is what it looked like before we didn't think they used to mow it year after year after year. And I would say to them, this year, could you just not mow this patch? And they said, oh, no, we won't. That's okay. And then they'd mow it. And then, and you know, last year I said to you, would you <coughs> not mow this patch? Yeah. Could you just not do it this year and this time? Yeah, that's fine. Then they'd mow it. And on year three, they finally got the message and within that period of time, suddenly we got <coughs> colonies of these two species. We're just not mowing. And it was quite, you know, quite a big area, so I was quite pleased. Within the first year, we started seeing things like the Essex Skipper and the Small Copper. So that was rather exciting. David Larkin. Okay, some of you might need David Larkin. So David, conservation manager. I think, from my point of view, one of the most amazing things that he did was to introduce sheep grazing into Brightland Hove uh, uh, urban environment. Because it, it, it brings this whole thing about management and this whole thing about getting engaged with uh, the maintenance of, of our habitats uh, for people in the urban setting in a way that I can't think of any other way that will. I've ranted all of my life about the value of butterflies, of wildflowers, of bees. Get sheep in our butterfly haven and people run for miles 
just as it, but they can go over into like a bit of farmland to see them. It's the novelty, I think, of having it in the middle of the city. And I remember a grandfather running with his daughter and the sheep were going off in the, <laughs> the lorry. They'd been there for a week and a half. He said, have we missed them? <laughs> yes, you have. Oh my God, what am I going to tell her? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I think it's fantastic that what Dave's done. I mean, another thing that he did was to reintroduce coppicing, cutting right down low in the Stanmer woodlands, all of those hazel and stuff, uh, <coughs> because that's, that's brought in things like silver wash artillery. And of course, he's really encouraged the, the wilding project uh, at Waterhall, which is, I think it's going to be really exciting as a developing. But in our cases, that David would come along or send one of his colleagues along and we'd put the fencing around. And of course, we then get sheep in. Now, sheep, from my, from my point of view, sheep was really important because we'd be forever having all kinds of problems if we didn't hammer the grass, because grass will still, type of grow, still try to grow in between the wildflowers. And wildflowers seem much better adapted at coping with, uh, uh, with grazing than the grasses. And that was what it looked like in 2009. Now, you know, from my point of view, I'm now beginning to think that looks good, interesting habitat for early successional chalk grass and butterflies. It looks very good. Oh, by the way, look, this was so pleasing. We'd never seen it before. This is a bramble leaf here, but just underneath it there is a brimstone butterfly. We'd not seen that brimstone butterfly on the site before. And that was just hanging over the edge into the butterfly haven. So... 2009. Now I think some of you will be thinking, that looks quite nice. Maybe it does look quite nice, but it's not always the best thing for invertebrates. You see, we have preconceived ideas about what is beautiful. There's a sort of ascetic uh, framework that we have in our minds that allows us to sort of be lulled into a full sense of security about what, what is good and what is not good. I remember the Parks Department sowed a wildflower mix, which was a cornflower mix, into the old tennis courts at Preston Park. And it looked stunning. Poppies, cornflowers, corn cockles, I can't remember, a whole bunch of things. But all of these are what we call archaeophytes, so things which were only really introduced into the UK about 500 years ago. They were brought by various different people. They're not, not really truly native. So they're not particularly good as pollinating plants. They look fantastic and they get loads of people on board and there's loads of people taking photographs, but there's a bigger message to be uh, given through. So when we go back to that and I look at that and I think, oh my word, I can see that that's going to be really good. I don't necessarily say that about that. And the reason why is because like, th this is completely covering all of the ground. And if you were to put your hand on the chalk downland in, over here, where it's a bit bare, and then put it into some vegetation, you will feel a temperature difference. And with all of these species of invertebrates that we're trying to conserve, what you find is, is that they're at the very northern edge of their European range here in, in the UK. And so they need every nook and cranny orientated to produce the greatest temperatures to warm up their body chemistry to make things work for them. So, even though there are species and there are opportunities within this to make this work, it's not always the best thing to see this great big floral displays. This was one of our target species. I told you about that. This is a small blue. So this is really exciting. We had a group, of, uh, a group from the Biodiversity Record Centre come down and they started surveying the site for us. And within a very short time, they found two females laying eggs. I mean, I was just absolutely delighted. They've been there ever since. You know, um, David Bellamy, we all remember the late Professor David Bellamy, uh, who was, a, I was very lucky to got, get to know David very well, actually, over time. And uh, he was truly the man that you saw on TV. That's who he was. He was a very passionate, very kind, very uh, giving person. And he came down regularly to help us because he could see that it was a valuable job. But you can see, again, look, he's very pictorial. But the news does get better because not all of it looks like this. There are other bits which are open. You can see here, look, there's a lot of chalk here in amongst this. So the news gets better. So we've got the small blue becomes, uh, colonises the site and begins to breed there. This here is a green hair streak, which is, you know, really exciting to see a green hair streak. Um, then we get singletons of the chalk hill blue. Again, a, a target species. Perhaps one of the most exciting things. We're only 18 months in, you see. 
This is the Adonis blue. Now, there was a time in the 1970s when we thought here in the UK we'd lose this species. Uh, Myxomatosis was a big problem because it killed the rabbits and there was no sheep grazing, so everything grew like mad. And this butterfly really, really needs very, very l l uh, short sward so that the sun can get to the ground, heat up its host plant and therefore be able to survive. So to see this on our site in 18 months was amazing. Now, I did go to butterfly conservation. I've, I've been a member of, of that organisation for quite some time. And I said to them, what, 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 what could we introduce? Don't do it, they said. Don't do it. Just see what happens. And I'm so pleased we took that advice at that point. I'm so pleased we did, because the nearest colony, as we know for that, is like three kilometres away. So that's a remarkable thing. Here we have a tiny little butterfly about this size, managing to find a host plant three kilometres away. So what is going on there? Well, think about it. They've got these two massive great big antennas. Look how big that is in comparison to its eye. It's a massive organ. So these antennae are olfactory organs, they're the noses. But there's one going out there, and there's one going out there. So it's like having ears. You can figure out where things are by smelling. It's directional. And of course they've got wings. So I think many, many, many ecologists don't realise that these organisms are designed to distribute throughout the landscape. And in the early 70s, when colonies were so small that there weren't factors... Well, these are called density-dependent effects. What happens is, is when there's lots and lots and lots of butterflies and you're a female and you've mated and you just want to lay your eggs in peace, you don't want lots of males forever giving you a hard time because they want to mate with you. So those females, in very, very dense populations, fly off because they're just sick to death of it. <laughs> I don't blame them. So they fly off. And that's how the species regulates its uh, dispersal. So it's very straightforward and very understandable for us. So anyway, here we were, you know, I couldn't believe it. And th that's a coupling pair on site. I was just blown away by this. The green hair streak in 2011, look, here we are, laying eggs. This has never been a successful species on our site. It seems to come and go, but nevertheless, it's there. So here are 2011, we got the, remember it was 2007 we set up. Small blue now are really doing nicely. So we, we, if you want to see the small blue, go to Liz Williams Butterfly Haven the first couple of weeks of May. This is a very typical sort of thing. Uh, there are times when you, know, that you can go there and there's, there's a, a thousand maybe, you see. It's, it's really, really exciting to see small blues there. But they are tiny, as big as my finger now. Um, the large skipper was our 21st species. And it's, it, in this year, it was the earliest record of this species in the UK that year. So it was the 8th of May, 2011. And I, I just say that because it's sort of an anecdote in a way, really, because we are right on the South Coast. But also, think about it, climate change is forever having an impact. And look, we're a decade beyond now, aren't we? So it's forever having an impact. This was three weeks early. Normally, three weeks later on. Okay, yellow rattle. I'm sure many of you have heard of yellow rattles. So it's a hemiparasite on grass. It puts its roots down to the grass. It doesn't really kill the grass, but it does certainly sap it of its energy. And uh, it's a pretty flower, uh, adds to the diversity of the site, and also makes it a lot easier for the wildflowers to grow as well. So I contacted the warden at Castle Hill National Nature Reserve. Probably one of the best bits of biodiversity law, by the way, is creation of nature, national nature reserves, picking the best bits. It's a bit like, you know, Indiana Jones when he puts that thing in the big warehouse at the end? Well, that's how I see national nature reserves. They are the big warehouse of all the really, really important stuff. And it's from those places where we should be thinking about disseminating all of that rich treasure and multiplying it elsewhere, which is exactly what I'm doing here. So actually, I did my PhD it's one of my major sites. I was here for five years working on that site. Uh, and so I'm sweet netting, collecting yellow rattle seed to transplant into the butterfly haven. But look, I don't know if you can see, but there's caterpillars, there's snails, there's spiders, there's flies. It's not just the wildflower seed that you get there. It's a whole part of the biota. So you're forever bringing this uh, with a very simple um, collection method to increase the biodiversity of sites. So remember, I'm not trying to recreate ancient chalk grass, and I am trying to really increase the opportunities for wildlife on this site. Oh, uh, Patrick Barkham came down. He, uh, he's uh, quite, some of you may know, quite a successful 
uh, Guardian journalists. And this is always really good for any conservation project if you are recognised in this way. I mean, it, it really does help you because if you're recognised and if, you, if there are things uh, written about what you do, then it helps in the long run because people take you seriously. Um, now, look, one of the things which we had noticed was that all the grass was getting quite rank. This is now what? I don't know when this, maybe 2012, I don't know. Grass was getting quite rank. It means growing, growing quite tall and beginning to... Um, beginning to make it difficult for some of the wildflowers to grow. And I thought, well, we need a couple of scrapes. So I spoke to the parks department and they came in with a bulldozer for me. And they cut through here because I wanted to have some pure bits of chalk within our chalk banks. And you say, hang on a minute, Dan, chalk banks? That's not chalk. And I so slowly began to realise what happened was that I said to the, the um, contractors, would you do this with the chalk banks and make this construct? And then I went on holiday, came back and it was all done. But no, in fact, they hadn't really got that quite right. And I realised that in fact if we're going to do this type of work you really really can't mix subsoil with chalk bedrock it has to be pure chalk i remember saying chalk dust is biodiversity gold dust um so look this now is the butterfly haven mark two we had von dean college say look we'd really like to have something similar to this what what could we do and i said well look leave it to me uh, tell me where you want it and we'll talk to the parks department and uh, one of the things we noticed was, was that instead of it being south face, south north facing banks uh, giving us the most variety of wildflowers and invertebrates, it was actually the west east, which is kind of weird when you think about it. And I realised that what we really need to be focusing on is multiple aspects. So I said to the guy, curvy linear shapes, so I want you to create curved crescent moons, starfish, as many different aspects as possible so the sun comes down here it will hit that one and in a different way it hit that one and as it goes across the sky we're changing the temperature all the time so we did that uh here's john gapper again and all we really did was plant it up with a, a little bit of wildflower seed we put some uh we put some kidney vetch on it i think but we didn't do very much about it because we'd learned from the liz williams butterfly haven that if you put plant too much on it too quickly too much seed actually you're speeding up that process of it eventually like you guys do scrub bashing that's what we expect to happen to our bit of chalk grassland it will do that so we really minimized it and then look this is now this must be about eight <coughs> years later on eight years later on does not look much different but look it's got its own colony of the small blue now this is part of the big leap of faith that the public needs to have because if we need to get our biodiversity back, we need to accept that something like this is, has value. I think that's really, really important to understand. Now look, as I've worked more and more with the conservation of chalk grass and invertebrates, and as I've worked more and more in woodlands and that sort of thing, I've realised that what looks good to me now is what I know is going to be really good for the target organisms I'm trying to conserve. So I moved away from, oh, isn't that pretty? But isn't that amazing? We've chopped that tree right down to the ground and it looks brilliant, doesn't it? And that's a mindset. And we're just working in Corfu at the moment with Jacob Rothschild, Lord Rothschild. And he said to me, would you like to come and help increase the butterflies on our land? And I said, yeah, sure, but you're not going to like it. He said, why not? I said, well, we're going to tell you to cut some of those olive trees down. <sighs> he didn't like it. We're still talking about it, though. Um, Anyway, so I started thinking about this, you know what? Chalk is a high contrast material. Uh, and as you can see here, look, this was the one, this is the, the Van Dien one. You can see this is all from Google Earth. And this is when we asked them to remove that, those bits out of the linear things. We're jumping ahead here to where, what it looks like now. But I realized that we actually could create what's called geoglyphs. So these are well known, like the Nazcar Indians in Peru, did great big spiders and things. And they can only be seen from space and those guys must have had some kind of weird idea about how you see things from above. But of course, we can see things using Google Earth all the time now. So here's an opportunity. If you have a conservation project, you can really, really make your mark literally when you're doing your work because people looking at a map can see it. In fact, only today while I was researching for this talk, I found there's a company in Wiltshire that's done the most immensely large, great big chalk bank uh, which you wouldn't believe. It's an enormous thing. And it's a big company that does, works with aggregate and chalk and things like that. 
And they're really proud of themselves because, you know, they know they're making a difference. Uh, so, look, let me talk about this man. I have so much time for this man. He was our city ecologist. He initiated the UNESCO-designated Living Coast Biosphere Region in, by trying to get a conference going about the question of do we have a biosphere city for Brighton and Hove. I thought it was amazing. Uh, he worked to promote the uh, 2010 International Year of Biodiversity. We went to London and I said, hey, Matthew, what about we do this for the year? He came back within a week and said, let's do it. And we had a whole year, we put a whole series of events on to try and get people interested in biodiversity over the course of uh, uh, the year. Uh, he led on the Nature Improvement Area Scheme, which, which I think it was 200,000 200, 200, wildflower plants that we got funding for as a city and we planted them all over the city on council estates and all kinds of things like that. So he's a really, really impressive guy. He now works at um, Stenning on uh, Stenning Downland Scheme. Uh, dead, uh, a devout Christian and it's great because they are as well and so he's really happy where he is. Uh, but he did some great work and for me he was a fantastic uh, uh, colleague to work with because when I did the Butterfly Haven he said... This is, we've got to start talking to more people about this. And so he arranged for me to have conversations with Parks Department, with the planners, uh, and I gave talks not dissimilar to this. Graham Rolfe, now retired, uh, operations manager uh, of, of a third of Brighton and Hove. When I gave my talk in Stanmer Park to a whole bunch of Parks Department people, he said, I'm disregarding my training and my lifetime of professional experience by doing what you're suggesting. And he went out and did it. He went out and did it. He created 15 butterfly or bee banks in Brighton and Hove, some of the best ones that we have now. Uh, and uh, he believes it's far easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. <laughs> uh, he's a very interesting guy. I, I, before this talk came along, I went and had a, a nice cup of coffee with him for about an hour in Asda Marina. Uh, and uh, Sorry, at the marina down there by Asda. And it was... It's fantastic. It's really nice to see he's been retired for six years now, but still very passionate, still very positive. I think all of these are admirable qualities. So he worked a great deal. Look at this, taking it all on board. So the curvy linear nature, this is in Brighton and Hove now, this Hollingbury, Carden. It was fantastic. Uh, I think this is down in oh, Surrenden somewhere. Really fantastic to see good ideas being utilised. Um, this was the biggest one. This is at the White Hawk uh, East, East, what do you call that? East Park? East, I don't know. East Brighton Park, yeah. And it's fantastic because what's great about this is that they, they did minimal planting and seeding and it doesn't look much different to that <coughs> now. But I know by looking at it that it's going to make a contribution for 20, 25 years, maybe. This man, I love this man. He's one of my best friends. So this is Mark Gapper. Mark Gapp is a Habitat Restoration and Grasslands Manager. It's taken him a long time to get to that point. Mark is passionate about the cultivation of our local uh, native orchids. He's a leading expert in the management of species-rich urban gar grasslands and he's an advocate of local nature conservation initiatives throughout the city of Brighton Hove. And uh, if it wasn't for Mark, a lot of the management that we've tried to do over the course of the years would never have happened. Right, okay, so this is a classic one here. So Mark's saying, well, Danny said to me, if chalk dust really is biodiversity, but gold dust, why don't we just throw it on the ground and plant things in it? And this was at one of the nature festivals that we used to have at Stanmer Park. Um, and, you know, it's immediate. People understand you can do that. Not many people would think I can plant straight into chalk. But in fact, it's, it's perfect for all of these plants because they're adapted to living in it. Some of them have like tap roots that go down this much, you know. Um, and I was really pleased, I was able, after some period of time, able to nominate Brighton Hope City Council for the Marsh Christian Trust Award. And John and Mark went up to get this award. They had a big lump sum of money for the work they were doing. They got these lovely, uh, uh, beautiful things from uh, Richard Lewington, who does great illustrations of butterflies and uh, placard. And I've got my comedy moustache. <laughs> right, anyway, Paul Gorringe, you must, if you've not met Paul, then you're missing out. So Paul, countryside ranger, renowned for his overflowing enthusiasm, passionately engages the public with nature, and responsible for planting up many of the city's uh, butterfly and bee banks. So can you see, it's not about one person, is it? 
it's about a team of people, you know, and, and we're forever recruiting more people to be on board, on board with these things. Look at this, engaging people at Brighthelm Gardens. I was lucky enough just to walk through Brighton one day and there was Paul working with these people. It's a tiny little butterfly haven, but look at the good it was doing. I mean, it's like there's all these people involved in this process, and I think that looks kind of pretty. Anyway, look, uh, by the time, this time, I, I don't even know when I'm talking about anymore now, but this is um, about 19 of them at this point. This is probably about 2013, something like that. I'm not quite sure. 19 of these havens all around. I don't know how Dorothy Stringer got to be number seven when we were the first. <laughs> but anyway, there you go. And, of course, it's a shame they don't call it the Lewis Williams Butterfly Haven. But anyway... Uh, Pete West, who was mayor at that point, who was a very supportive Green councillor, he said, butterfly and bee banks are elegantly simple ways of making space for nature within the city of Brighton and Hove without costing too much money. We all want some of that, don't we? Um, so the next big step for us was this, Dorothy Stringer's artificial turf pitch. This pitch um, is a lovely pitch. I, I'm surprised to hear myself say that, really. You wouldn't think I would be advocating putting down a plastic football pitch. Well, yeah, I am. Why? Well, my school, at, uh, the school I worked in, had been built for 600 children. At the time I left, there were 1,700 children there. So you can imagine this patch of ground here was hammered to hell with all the kids going out doing PE on it. In the, in the, in the winter, it was a mud bath like the Somme, and then in the summer, it was like a desert, you know, because it was just, nothing grew on it. So we made this grant application uh, through the Football League or something to, to have this done. And, of course, this opened up great opportunities for us to be able to put in mitigation for biodiversity loss. Now, from my point of view, that bit of pitch was useless anyway. I mean, it was municipal grassland for a start, and it was hammered to hell by all these feet on it. But the opportunity to get some mitigation for biodiversity loss was overwhelming. I want you to be aware of this bank here. We'll come back to that. So remember this, the value of geoglyphs. Remember, you know, you know that the Longman and Wilmington or the horse here and high over, they have strong cultural resonances for local people. And also, they, you know, they really do shine out. So look, I spoke to Vandine School, Balfour School, um, Vandine College, and I asked them to, you know, give us some ideas about if you were to do this, if we could involve you in this process as part of mitigation, could you give me ideas about what you wanted? So they, all of these things they suggested. And eventually we came up with these plans here. These would be what we would put on the ground. And look, here we are. This is the whole campus now. This is the original Liz Williams Butterfly Haven. And we're going to have lots of chalk here. We're going to dump some... Uh, that you've already seen. That's where the pitch is now. We're going to have some there. We're going to do a nice butterfly haven thing here. These amazing dolphins, this is, that's their logo at Vandine School. This is Balfour School, Butterfly for Balfour. And they wanted us now up here at, at Vandine College. But I should just tell you, I mean, I'm putting this in because I still think it's a great idea. Like the original paper. You know that original paper I spoke to you about? They never did it in the end because it was an idea. They wanted to do this on some chalk grass and near St. Catherine's Hill, near Winchester. But they never did it because they weren't given permission by the planners for fear of disturbing archaeological concerns. But those scientists put that paper out because they thought it was a good idea and hoped that someone would pick up and run with it. And that's what we'd done. So here I put this idea out because I'm thinking this is quite a good idea. We did not do this in the end. Now look, fashions may change, but economics never do, do they? They run out of money, so they couldn't do this. So that was really, really disappointing from my point of view. In fact, you know, I look back now and I think, if I was to go back into those meetings with all those contractors and all those various people now, I would have been a lot more firm about what I expected to come out of that than I was at the time. But it was quite intimidating, I have to say. Anyway, so look, here we are. We end up doing very small uh, butterfly banks, but with each of the schools and working with the children, producing some, butterfly, uh, some uh, educational exercise with them at the same time. So here's a, the council turn up with loads and loads of wildflowers. Collecting wildflowers, you know, uh, this is again back at Castle Hill National Nature Reserve and the children are collecting lots and lots of wildflowers, uh, in this case yellow rattle, but we could, because they were collecting by hand, you could say we want this species or we want that species and that was far more valuable if we had target species to get in. Now remember that here, this, this bank at the back, 
The contractors desperately wanted to cover this with loam, you know, some topsoil, and put perennial ryegrass. And this was one thing that I did actually. At this point, it was obvious we weren't going to get much of what we wanted. And I said, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to leave it, and we're going to work with that, and we're going to produce that. So what we did was we got the children to grow, uh, uh, sorry, plant at the, the back here, just thousands and thousands of um, horseshoe vetch plants. You can see them all over here. Not down here. And the, the ethos here is that the plants grow and they're of value to the butterflies, uh, but as they produce seed, it spills down. And over the years, so you've got some longevity with regards to this habitat. So it's all about making these habitats last as long as possible. Because in the end, they will not be what they are now. And they will have like tree suckers and buddliers and things all coming out of them. Which is then when you begin to realise that we're talking about succession, that they will, like human beings, grow, be born, grow and die, as it were, or not be what they were. So that therefore leads to the idea that if we want to make these habitats available for these organisms, we need to continuously make them. Which is why what Brighton and Hove did, producing those initial 19 banks, or 18, was so very valuable. So we did get through the mitigation some re-landscaping. We'd learned a great deal. So this now is, you remember it used to be all loads and loads of linear rows? Now we've got curvilinear structures. Now we've got bare chalk. The whole thing is really quite astonishing. Look, watch this. So this is actually what it looked like after they done the work. It looks like horrendous, doesn't it? But no, this was fantastic. Notice this side, loads of chalk. Not so much here. But there is chalk in it. You can see it's pale. But it gives you some idea of how, I think, bold we were trying to be with, our, with regards to our art. Because we are painting on the landscape. This is also very helpful. So look, the Adonis blue butterfly is a very particular butterfly. I told you that it needs lots of bare ground. Here's bare ground. Uh, and this is its host plant. These patches here. So why is it like that, Dan? Well, this, this is... You'll all know this. You go from Falmer to Lewis, and there's a petrol station on the left, on the A27. And just before that, there's this great big slope, uh, which looks like this. But it's, the gradient is so steep that any dead plant material that falls off then begins to fall down, and the soil cannot begin to accumulate on it. So this has been here like this since, well, I came, I came here in 94, and I think they'd cut this through maybe two or three years before. So this is a very, very long-lasting habitat because of that gradient. So the gradient simply makes it difficult for the soil to uh, be produced. And that allows this, here's the caterpillar of it, with the ants, a symbiotic relationship with the ants. That allows this type of habitat to be created. So just pure conjecture through observation begins to teach you a great deal about what we're trying to do when we're talking about ecological engineering of these habitats. So here we are, this gives you some idea, this is 2015 to 6. Now remember, in part, all we've done is move stuff around. If you remember at the very bottom here, this, I, sorry, I'll do it here. If you remember, originally, before it looked like this, we pulled this, all of the topsoil down and we put it down there. What we've done this time is we took all that topsoil from there and we put it down there. This is outside the reserve now. And then we scrape these down and put that topsoil there. So it was kind of topsoil and chalk uh, bedrock together. Now that was amazing, really amazing. Didn't anticipate what happened next. Outside here where all that really, really rich soil was just become a complete... Um, uh, expanse of stinging nettles. Um, I'd say double the size of this room, maybe three times the size of this room. And that was amazing because often you hear in your uh, advice that you get about gardening, have some stinging nettles. Well, you might be lucky to have the odd red admiral lay an egg here or there, but when you've got a, an area three times the size of this room, red admirals, commas, peacocks, tortoiseshells, all of those animals start using it. So you need a large area for that. And these are 
very, very different types of butterflies with very, very different types of ecology. They're what we call the wider countryside species. They fly widely throughout the countryside, finding bits of stinging nettles, laying their eggs, nectaring on whatever they can find. Their canvas is much bigger than the tiny little things that we were looking at earlier on. So it made a great deal of sense later on. It's the case now. It's about this much over here. We've now extended the butterfly haven to include that big patch of stinging nettles, which of course makes our diversity of butterflies even more exciting. And look, this is, you know, shortly afterwards, this is one of the banks with lots and lots of uh, <laughs> horseshoe vetch for the Adonis blue and the chalk hill blue. This is a summer spring. The natural thing that happens is this mignonette coming up. The oxide daisies always seem to be one of the first ones there. But remember, what I didn't tell you, remember what we'd done was we'd added so much in terms of biodiversity that it was all there in the seed bank. All we needed to do was disturb it. We didn't need to plant anything in it. Suddenly it's all coming back. We had had sheep, but we hadn't had a very good relationship with our shepherd. So what we did was we didn't have sheep for about five years and so we'd have volunteers to do brush cutting and that meant we could get the area really quite well managed and surgically because we'd be able to do that work exactly where we wanted it how we wanted it where sheep are not so uh, discriminating in that respect um, and then we started working with the millennium seed bank I had this fantasy idea that, was it, I don't know, was it Queen's something Jubilee? <laughs> Maybe 10 years ago. And I said, let's make a big butterfly bank off Sussex in the grounds of Buckingham Palace. So I rung up the Millennium Seed Bank and said, this is what we're thinking of doing. What do you think about it? And they kind of said, well, great idea, but... But it started a relationship. And we started as a city working more and more with the Millennium Seed Bank. And we've done a lot of projects with them over, over the years. Um, and what was really lovely about working with them was we came up with this idea. Okay, I did a literature review of all the sources of the host plants uh, and the nectar sources for the different butterflies. Uh, we came up with this seed mix for these nectar sources and host plants and said to the Millennium Seed Bank, do you think you could grow this and make this for them? And they said, yeah, sure, we can. So then, once it took three years for them to do this, collect all the seeds and grow them and collect more and more seed and made this uh, batch. And I said, well, look, could you split it for me? And I looked in a book and I found out how high on average these plants grow. And I said, I want, in one of them, I want you to put for me all the short growing ones. And the other one, I want you to put all the long growing ones. Now, look, this is really manipulating an art a natural setting. This is very, very artificial. But at the same time, much of our management had been about trying to cut stuff really short so that we could have areas of bare ground and uh, more sun getting to the ground at the very least. And it, so it made sense that it, rather than give us just one lot of seed, maybe we could have two different lots and just plant them in this way to see what it would do. I thought this was a really good idea. Now look, this is Stuart West. He's a farmer of Bevendine uh, Farm. Uh, he's an award-winning farmer for his environmental practices. He's a supporter of the Bevendine Downs Conservation Group and he has been keen to aid local conservation groups who need landscape restructuring. Just the type of guy you want when you want us to do some more of this. So now we're down at the bottom of the Butterfly Haven and we've got all of these banks that we actually want to put in the sort of semi-nutrient poor stuff. So we did that. He's doing it just down the bottom here because I thought, well, we've got them all around here. This is, is this a waste? I'm not sure. And we did it. And we, BBC, CNN, they all turned up. They all wanted to know about CNN. I have got this tradition right now of killing, almost killing. <laughs> be a bit different if I had killed them nearly killing my colleagues one of my colleagues was having his breakfast eating his cornflakes watching CNN suddenly my face comes up now he's thinking he's watching American news he nearly choked <laughs> another colleague I was talking about this on Radio 4 but he didn't notice me until I came on and suddenly he heard me he nearly had a car accident <laughs> it again it's just brilliant if you can get this type of interest in your work because it just justifies, if, if, if the media think what you're doing is valuable, then uh, that's all good. But I've got to tell you, 
that thing that we decided to do with the, all of that three years, it didn't work. And it was not because of what the Millennium Seed Bank had given us. It's because by trying to make new banks out of that soil at the bottom, we disturbed the seed bank and the whole thing became flushed with thistles. So all of that really expensive seed that was there, all that money, you could say we wasted it. I don't know that we did because this is how we learn. I mean, mistakes are the great teachers, aren't they? I don't think I would ever, ever disturb soil like that again if I was trying to do something with different types of seed. Okay, the Lions report. Graham Lions did a survey of all of the different butterfly bee banks that there are in Brighton and Hove, or were in Brighton and Hove. Uh, this is, a, you can't see it, but it says total number of plant species recorded. Now look, um, actually I'm really disappointed I can't read this. Um, but in it, it shows here, this, we were at number seven, you see? 98 species there. Uh, this is a number of invertebrates of conservation status. So things which are rare and, you know, got a, some particular... This is number seven, the butterfly haven there again, at 16 species. Now, it might seem a bit trite of me to pick out the butterfly haven at Liz Williams, but I do so just to show that A, it's been there a long time. B, we've been managing it, you know, uh, seriously managing it for a long time. And did I say A, B, C, um, we, uh, yeah, we think we've got the ecological engineering right. Sizes and another thing. Look, he said the fact that 745 species, that's invertebrates and its uh, wildflowers, can be found in 1.26 hectares is an incredible success for Brighton Hove City Council. So all of these together made up this many species. 58 uh, invertebrates with conservation status too. The B Bank project should be considered an incredible success. The future of the banks will, however, depend on suitable management, but this is all achievable. So. This is what he said about us. The largest bank initially uh, work started in 2007. The bank outshone most of the other banks with 16 species of invertebrates here with conservation status, the varied topography and structure was excellent and the management of the bank was particularly good. I wasn't surprised to hear him say this. I know it sounds a bit arrogant, but we'd worked so very hard and thought so very much about what we were trying to do all the time that it was not a surprise that this had done so well. Look at this now. So this is ecological engineering. It does count. You can now see the sun's shining from the south, and here is the dark of the north-facing bits. But there, you know, here, this is not so much north-facing. This is a little bit now, let's think about this. Uh, uh, never eat. So this is east-facing here, isn't it? This one here. Um, so this complexity within the environment is in part what leads to our success. Size two. I genuinely believe, you know, the Butterfly Haven at Liz Williams is so much bigger than any of the others. And whilst it is valuable, I think, to make these small things, particularly from an educational point of view, if we really, really want to make a difference, we need to be thinking a bit more outside the box. We're no longer in a position to be purists. With the way in which climate change is happening and the way in which global biodiversity loss is happening, we need to use every single tool in the conservationist toolbox. I was talking to Kim Dawson, the biodiversity officer for Brighton and Hove, the other day, and they're talking about producing a very, very small bank somewhere near Withdean. It's really small. I think it could possibly be a, that side of the corner there. I said, what do you hope to do? You know, you remember these banks were originally created for invertebrates, you know. The temptation can be just to plant them up with seed and make them look like wildflower banks. Because people in their minds are still thinking about the 1970s and the 80s when they did ornamental planting. And the, you have to resist that temptation because whilst it can look pretty and you can have some wildflowers in situ, what does it really do to the whole ecosystem? It needs to be a little bit deeper thinking than that. So I said, why don't you, you know, plant it up just a little bit of kidney vetch and then introduce some small blue butterflies? Because if you did plant kidney vetch on it, whilst it's possible they might find it. With such a small bank, such a small bank, it's highly unlikely that you're going to find those animals coming to it uh, when there are no obvious sites around. And they resisted that idea. And I think that as time goes by and as they're in doing this more and more, they might start changing their minds, I think. OK, look, now I retired 18 months ago. And it was very obvious to me that if I'm not at the school anymore, 
uh, what they're going to do about this. So we set up the Friends of the Liz Williams Butterfly Haven. So these are passionate people. One of the things I did not anticipate was during the um, lockdown, there was uh, really a great deal of interest in, um, in the Butterfly Haven. People, ha this, this guy here, he had a serious accident. He was in the middle of lockdown, he got on his bicycle, he drove up the road, and you think there's no one around, but a car came whizzing around and smacked into him, broke legs, arms, all, all kinds of things. He recovered, and coming to the Butterfly Haven was just like a lovely thing for him, you know? For him, it was a spiritual thing. There have been a lot of people that have told me this through the social media. Um, so, oh, sorry. So, yeah, look, here we are. This is uh, Lizzie Dean, I think her name is, the mayor now. She's a green councillor, and we're just reopening it here with a nice new placard. It's a South Downs National Park, who've part funded that. Uh, we've also got, you can see here, uh, I think £4,000 worth of, funding, of fencing we put in around this larger area now, so, which is really, really exciting. So much easier. Dave Larkin doesn't have to come out with his electric fencing anymore. It's so much easier for us to do this. And it's an increased area, as I said. Now, do you remember what I told you about the small blue butterfly? Maybe introducing that. 33 species of butterfly have been found in the Lizard in Butterfly Haven since 2007. That's 89% of all the butterfly species recorded in the city of Brighton and Hove. 89% in an area half the size of a football pitch. So imagine what you could do if we had much more of this and we could dedicate these types of... Remember the original photograph I showed you where it was just a little bit of land that wasn't part of a football pitch or anything else? There must be loads of land like that. Remember I showed you the bit at by the end of the football pitch that we... artificial football pitch we put in? If, that, if, if I hadn't argued the case, that would have been covered in a, Italian ryegrass. And yet that's got Adonis Blue on it, it's got Chalk Hill Blue, it's got Small Blue on it. This was different. This is Max Anderson, he did a PhD at Sussex University and he's now got a job working for butterfly conservation in the West. And he came to me and he said, Dan, this is local to you guys, Port Slade by Sainsbury's, there's a cr cricket pitch, he said, and I've discovered there's lots and lots of brown hair streak there and they're laying their eggs. He said, but I've just discovered that the, uh, what do you call him, groundsman, is just going to cut all of that back right there because it's growing over the edge of the pitch and all those eggs are going to fall to the ground. What do we do? Now, funnily enough, eight years earlier on, at Patcham, somebody had started seeing brown hair streak. So I thought, well, that's what we'll do. I said to him, Max, we're going to go collect those. We're going to get a little bit of black insulation tape, we cut them off and we're going to put them onto the black form that we put into our butterfly haven when we thought maybe they could come from Patcham eight years earlier on. And our black form was just perfect. So we did that two years ago. Then this was the first bit of sign that there was some interest there. There was a butterfly, a brown hair streak female found. And then that first, that first winter after we'd done it, we found eggs. And then, so we repeated the process, 40 eggs both times. This year, this is my one, I saw this one. This year we've seen it three times. So we will repeat this process for as long as they will destroy the habitat by cutting the edges for the cricket ground. I'm not making a judgment there, but as long as that happens, we will go collect some 40 eggs or so and put them in here and slowly boost this population. Why do I do that? Well, I suppose we've been sitting waiting for a long time. For eight years, we planted the black thorn, which is a host plant. We've been waiting for that amount of time for maybe a female to come our way from a site where the population density might not be that great. So why are we waiting for that random thing when we've done all that hard work? Why don't we just take this opportunity, which is what we've done? So this is an experiment. We're telling everybody we've done it so that everyone knows it's not a natural colonisation. But if it does work in a positive way, maybe this is something we need to be thinking more about. Other people might disagree. They might argue that this is not the thing to do. I think that's healthy. After 22 years, some things come as a surprise. This was when I got retired. So do you remember that there? They called it the Dan Danahar Butterfly Reserve, which was very nice. I didn't see that coming. Um... Alan Griffiths, nearly at the end now, guys. <laughs> Alan Griffiths retired. He supports, uh, uh, just recently, he retired this last week. So he supports residents around the city of Brighton and Hove to improve the biodiversity of the roadside verges. 
He liaises with utility companies and retains biodiversity, uh, to retain biodiversity during their maintenance procedures. And he's a strong advocate and supporter of the butterfly, of Coldine Lane Wildflower Meadow. So mm. you think about this, I'm thinking, I'm doing all this work every single day at, at school, school children, teachers, all those people getting some value of it. What about the public? So here we are, what more can we do? This is my house here, in fact, here. This is the hedge of my front garden. And here is a piece of roadside verge. It's a municipal amenity grass in between my house, the pavement, and the road. This is Coldine Woods here. So if you've come down Coldine Lane, you know what that is. So I spoke to Alan Griffiths, who was an operations manager, and I said, this is what I want to do. I'm not going to dig anything up because there's going to be all kinds of utility things underneath there. But I, will, I would like to start managing it and planting it up. So here we are. This is my lovely friend Edward. And in 2015, we mowed it as tight as we possibly could. And then Edward and I, one Christmas, it was Christmas Day and Christmas, Boxing Day and, and, and Christmas Eve. Yeah, we did this. We planted 5,000 wildflower plugs into it. And that's it now finished. He poked the hole. I put the plant in. Here we are. So this is a little bit of appropriate management. So one of the things I discovered very, very quickly was that people were walking over it and damaging things. So I cut with my lawnmower a little cross in it like this. And I also cut an edge around it. This is called a managed margin. And it tells people that all of that stuff growing in the middle there is intentional. And I couldn't believe it. I cut that like that. I have a, a, one of these drones. I cut it like that. And here's my drone up here, and suddenly these runners came along here and they run right through the middle. I was so <laughs> pleased. <laughs> well, of course, you know about removal of nutrients. So here's my good friend Mark Gapper coming along, and he mows it with this really industrial type of mower at the end of every year, just once a year. Uh, and then here's my son, Indiana, and I, and we, m we remove all this topsoil to rem not topsoil, uh, vegetation to remove the nutrients that they've taken out of the, the soil. So by getting rid of all of this stuff, we are forever taking the nutrients out. But there's a big, big uh, community of people who say, can we please have your hay and we'll put it somewhere else because we know there's wildflowers and seed in it. And here we are, that's it. And then look, oh, Millennium Seed Bank one day said, Dan, would you like some polygala and some thymus? Yes, please. This is what's great about networking, isn't it? So there, Indy and I are just putting that in the ground as well. So making the opportunities wherever they are, not really many fixed rules about this. This is summer 2017. Remember, we're 22 now, summer 22. I haven't actually seen it in the springs. So I've been to Greece so much on my other project. But that's really rewarding to see that. And look, you know, that's uh, looking quite nice, I think. Uh, this amazes me, okay? Look, it's a chalk hill blue. Fantastic, Dan, chalk hill blue, but where's that? There! <laughs> so this is like a rare butterfly in this tiny little bit of habitat. I've had chalk hill blues, I've had small blues. It's not perfect habitat for them. But obviously these animals are moving around. So if they're moving around, this is what we call metapopulation dynamics. It's populations within populations moving from one place to another. This is what they do. It's how they disperse, they find new, new uh, ground. If, if the soil is disturbed, <coughs> the early successional plants come in and we, we get that there like that. So target and non-target organisms, well, you know, there is my lovely uh, uh, Chalk Hill Blue. Here's Mark going through with his big, well, this is two different years here, look. But look at this. This was not target organism. Bank voles shot out of underneath. We didn't, they weren't target organisms. But we're creating a habitat which enhances wildlife for lots of things. And I have, you know, crows that come to my front lawn daily and have done for the last couple of years. And they're forever going in there to find something. Nowhere else. They don't go in the other bits of amenity grass and up here. They're in here. So it's really exciting to see foxes. I sometimes find foxes laying it at night. Well, right, finally, working with all sectors. Now, look, these guys, you wouldn't believe how many times I've had utilities companies say, we want to put a pipe through here. Uh, we're going to put an electric cable through here. We're going to put um, a, uh, in this case, broadband fibre. And I just see this as a fantastic opportunity, you know, to get these guys on. So they put a thing for your door, and then I give them a hard time. I don't mean a horrible hard time. I mean, I've, I'm fairly persistent, saying this is what we need to do. Thank you for letting me know. Do you realise this is an area of significant biodiversity value? And they nearly always, no, they always come back and they're positive about it. So these guys were really, really helpful. They took on board everything I said. We then started building a relationship. They then put out press releases. 
And then they've now, but this is city fibre and this is lanes infrastructure, they've now funded this lectern. So this is now going to go in the ground outside my house. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. <laughs> I haven't put my name on it. <laughs> so they're going to do this and it's telling people about the Coldean Wildflower Meadow. Because of course not everybody loves this. I've met people saying, when are you going to get rid of all those weeds out the front of your lawn? <laughs> And it's true, because and I've spoken to one man, he said, but you don't understand. When I moved here 40 years ago, I was sold on the idea that this was an estate, what did he call it? A garden estate. You know, we expect it all to be trimmed nice, and we'd expect it to have ornamental wildflowers. And I say, but, you know, things have moved on. It's not what it was. And there are things that we need to be concerned about now. So I think we need to reverse this trend. I think that this is just such a lovely thing, isn't it? Because we, we, you can see it just step by step. It still looks quite good at this point, but it's just a war of attrition. Not the tree goes at this point. And this is what, this is just natural. It's the way human beings live. And unless we start thinking about this in a much more holistic manner, then we're going to have this problem. And then I just have to leave you on this last cartoon because I think this is great. What if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> Thank you, you've been a great audience. Thank you, Thank you Dan. That, that was absolutely fascinating. I think, you know, so, so, so inspirational, really, to see what you've been doing and how you've been going about it. And... Uh, yeah, we can all learn from that, I think, and, and, and do, do our little things ourselves, yes. you know. I think we've got an opportunity to either get involved within other projects or do something ourselves outside our house, in our front gardens, in our back gardens, whatever. There is no limit, you're absolutely right, and I do think it's really important. I think w it, it's very easy, with them being at COP now and everybody arguing about what they're going to do and what they're not going to do, and then the climate thing doesn't seem to be resolved, and... It looks all very gloomy, but you know, it's all about us as individuals making a difference. That we have to grasp the horns. Yeah, I, I, I agree. We've got, we've got time for a couple of questions and then we're going to, to do the raffle. So, who wants to ask the first question? Okay. When, when you say we can all do something, what would you recommend? Just say again, sorry? When you say we can all do something, what would you recommend in small gardens that we do? Um, it depends what you want out to get out of your small garden, okay? So, for, it's funny, we're having this conversation in Corfu at the moment. You know, do you try to create some natural habitat in your garden? Or do you create something which maybe is really, really valuable to you as an individual because it looks aesthetically pleasing and you know that you're not going to be able to do a great deal in a small area? The point is this. Big areas, more areas more joined up, all of that is what we're trying to achieve. But if you've got a small area, then maybe it's not a bad thing to plant ornamental plants as long as you collect them, sorry, select them, so that they're good plants for nectar sources, Badlia, sedum, echiums, things like that. Might be fine for those wider countryside butterflies. But you can still do all of those, I mean, if you, I don't know how big your garden is, and it's like, it would be a, to answer your question, I'd need to see what your garden's like, you know. But a pond, it wouldn't be great. The more ponds there are, ponds are the same as butterfly havens, you know. They have lives, they're born and they die, they dry up in the end. I didn't tell you that, but I did a <laughs> two-year survey when, as an undergraduate on 25 pa farm ponds. And that's the bottom line, they grow up and they die. So we need to continuously create ponds because all the organisms in ponds, the plants and even fish, they adapted to getting from one pond to the next. So the more we do whatever we can do, you can make a pond, you could plant up wildflowers in your meadow, whatever you can, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you do something. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm really interested in um, when you have to work with the people who kept on digging up your front lawn, have you got any advice? Because most of us will have to interact with local services and people doing things initially which we can um, what our desires are. How do you, did you actually say to them, oh, actually, I don't mind if you dig up that patch, could, could you? No, I said, so, so I would say to them, look, hey, this is, um, do you realise that this is a significant area of biodiversity interest? 
that we are working in partnership with the parks and park, uh, the parks and uh, the parks department, local residents, um, and therefore, what I would like to do is have a conversation with you about how you can minimise the impact of the work that you're doing. So, in that case, I was saying to them, when you dig your <coughs> trench to put your cable in, could we first of all dig off the turf and put that to one side? Then, when you dig your hole. You can put your cables in, you can put your turf right back on top and it won't, that, that will probably cope very, very well. The other thing I didn't want them to do was for them to add, they love doing this, loam and, and with, some wealth, with some grass seed in it. They love to do that because it looks green and it looks like they haven't disturbed things. And, you know, the, the conversations that I had with City Fibre and with uh, Lanes Infrastructure, they suddenly realise, oh, well, it doesn't always have to be the way that we've traditionally done stuff. Now, look, I can understand that in some cases you may find individuals that haven't worked in partnership with this or with that, but you need to be able to just do a little bit of research yourself or decide in your own mind what it is that you think is important about that area and say, look, from my perspective, this is what I think is important and I would like you to have a conversation with you about trying to minimise the impact on those factors when you undertake your work. And what we find is that most of these companies will love it. In fact, on that, on that here, I actually say something about most responsible utilities companies will look after biodiversity when they undertake this type of work. So it's having a conversation, feeling confident about yourself with regards to you know, what you're trying to ask them to do. <coughs> Give yourself time to prepare for it. Uh, one more question. Um, yeah, I, I, I've been more slave, so you stop out butterflies? <laughs> I thought someone would say that. You've actually got lots, so I'm not too, feeling too bad about that. Um, but it, it just made me think, it's like, well, if, if I did say that, where would we put them rather than you put them in your uh, haven? And we've had someone illegally dumping a big pile of chalk. Um, and we've been trying to get it removed. Now, and I'm thinking now, is there actually an opportunity? Yes, yeah, a fantastic opportunity. <laughs> yeah, you see? This is how it works. This is how it works. You mean, like, you know, I, I take your butterfly eggs, I give you some information. You know, it's kind of a trade. But no, I think, I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, uh, how big is it? Well, there's a car park, and they dumped chalk, like a chalk farm, all around the side of the car park. Building spoil. Building spoil. Building spoil is still fine, because building spoil will have low nutrient value. So, you know, it really is an opportunity and what you need to do is, uh, I didn't put my email on there, dan at bignature.co.uk. Just email me with some photographs and then I'll send you back some ideas. We've got one more question and then um, we'll go through the platform. Um, it was just about how you can convince people not to dig up their gardens and put down concrete, <laughs> you know, because it's happening so much in Hamilton. It used to be... You know, 50 years ago, everybody had a proper garden, and even as you say, they don't have time to do the gardening. It doesn't matter. The wilder, the better, really. But now it's just sort of a massive concrete area. It is, and I think we're probably all hypocrites, aren't we? You know, we all do these things. We know what the best thing to do is. It's not good to point fingers at people. I think it's more all about encouraging people. I think enthusiasm is infectious. And I think that that's really where we must start whenever we're having any conversations. And maybe educating children. Well, it's why I call myself a biodiversity educationist. You know, it's what I've tried to do most of my professional career. The type of talk I've given you tonight, I hope, gives you a little bit more insight into what I've been trying to achieve, and hopefully that's good. Yeah. So can I say again, thank you ever so. That was, that was a really fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it, and I think everybody else did. So another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. May I, I do hope the one message I want to get home to you all is that it is never about one person. All of these people, I've yeah. deliberately tried to do that so that yeah, you I run. Think, I think that came across really well. That Good. It's, it's all about the team. It it's is, it is. The team effort and, and getting people inspired and involved. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that really did come across. Thank you. Well.